Hi, I'm Michelle Renee Lane, and I will be reading from my debut novel, Invisible Chains. Lynch and his guest arrived much later than expected. Big John was putting the horses and carriage away, so I greeted them at the door. I was immediately struck by Senior Velasquez's appearance. He was a tall man over six feet with long black hair that fell in soft waves about his face and rested on his shoulders. His charcoal gray suit conformed to his slim, muscular frame. As handsome as he was, something about him made his appearance unsettling. I couldn't decide if it was his unnaturally pale skin or his green eyes that glowed like a cat's. Maybe it was the glimpse of sharp canines that were just visible when he smiled. It wasn't one thing or another that caused me to stare. He was hauntingly beautiful, yet repulsive at the same time. Even though we'd never met, I recognized him. Lynch stepped inside the house as I held the door open for him, but his guest hesitated like he was expecting a formal invitation. Carlos, please enter. You are most welcome in my home. Senor Velazquez stepped across the threshold. The air shimmered and rippled even though the day's heat had passed with the setting sun. A chill ran down my back as he entered the house. He arched an eyebrow and grinned at me when I took his overcoat. When the stranger entered the parlor, Lottie rose out of her seat in a flurry of black silk and lace, like some strange lovesick turkey buzzard, and eyeballed him like he was a dead animal carcass ripening in the heat of the sun. She even licked her lips. I knew that look. She'd given that same look to her music teacher before he'd ended up beaten and broken on the floor. Every man who crossed her path was in danger of being eaten alive. Heaven help the man who didn't desire her as much as she desired him. Welcome, Senor Velazquez. We are so happy to have you in our home. Thank you, Madam Lynch. His accent was heavy, but he spoke French well. I had heard other Spaniards in the French market, but never speaking my native tongue. Please, call me Charlotte. There is no need to stand on ceremony here. She was visibly shaken by his beauty. Her cheeks were flushed, and she fanned herself like it was the hottest day of summer. That being the case, who is this lovely creature who greeted me at the door? James never mentioned her when he invited me to New Orleans. He turned to me and smiled. I wasn't sure what he was up to, but he made me uneasy. I took a, spe a step back and almost tripped over my own feet. My nerves were jangled. Could he really be the man for my dreams? Jacqueline's one of our slaves. She'll show you to your room and see that all of your needs are met. While I have few needs, I doubt this young woman can satisfy all of them. He did little to hide his sarcasm. I just stood there staring at him, not sure if I should run and hide. Jacqueline, didn't you hear me? Take our guest bags up to his room. Lottie spoke the words through clenched teeth. She was agitated by the stranger's interest in me and fanned herself so quickly I thought she might snap the fan in half. Yes, mademoiselle. I scurried to grab the two black leather valises by the front door and carried them up to the second floor. As I climbed the staircase, fear stabbed at me between my shoulder blades like something was creeping up on me. I glanced over my shoulder. Senor Velazquez was walking a few steps behind me, his eyes boring a hole into my back. Another chill passed through me like someone had walked over my grave, and my arms broke out in goosebumps. Whoever this man was, I didn't trust him. If my bags are too heavy, I can carry them. He sounded sincere. No, Mishy, Mamza Lynch told me to carry them. Do you do everything she tells you? He joked with me in an exaggerated whisper. Have to. I'm a slave. I'm sure you break a few rules every now and then, he teased and gently poked me in the ribs. No, Mishy. I do what I'm told. Was he trying to get me into trouble? If he was a friend of James, of James Lynch, 
he must have an evil streak. No one that man dealt with <clears throat> was ever a true pillar of the community. Sounds boring to me. A little danger can be fun. Don't want any trouble, Mishi. The door to the guest room swung open as I nudged it with my foot. I carried the bags inside and placed them on the floor next to his bed. I stood up, I stood up straight to release the knots in my back and reclaim a little dignity. Mama always told me to stand up tall no matter how low I felt. A straight backbone on a slave was like spitting in the master's eye. Will I see you again this evening? His tone was playful, but he blocked the exit. I'll be serving dinner. I spoke to a spot on the wall behind his head. I couldn't make eye contact, but I didn't want to seem rude. Am I to dress for dinner? Yes, Mishi. You may use the bathroom for washing up. There's a cistern that feeds water into the pipes. I gestured behind me and down the hallway to the back of the house. Dinner is at eight o'clock. Thank you, Jacqueline. He made a bridge with his arm in the door frame and forced me to pass under it to leave the room. I brushed past him and tried to avoid contact with his body, but he filled up most of the doorway. He smelled the air around me as I walked into the hall. Oh, and don't worry, I won't tell anyone your secret. What secret? The air around you is practically crackling with energy. I can almost smell the magic. He folded his arms across his chest and leaned back against the door frame, satisfied with his discovery. Are you a Bokor? I don't know what that is, but I assume you mean a practitioner of magic. No. Then how do you know about me? We all have secrets. He whispered the words with his mouth pressed to my ear, then took a step back and winked at me. See you at dinner. Hi, I'm Anna Taborska, and I'm going to read you a couple of extracts from my story, The Cat Sitter. Uh, the story is about a shy girl called Jane who travels to the village of Wraithsfield in Sussex, in England, to look after her old college friend's cat. The cottage that the friend lives in borders a rather eldritch wood. The Cat Sitter at 15 acres, the wood wasn't particularly large, but the brooding, oppressive atmosphere, which so belied the usual beauty of ancient English woodland, gave it an air of menace infinitely vaster than its physical area. If an unwary rambler, caught up amongst what should have been a splendid array of native trees, were to analyse why he or she felt unease rather than tranquillity amongst the leafy bowers of ash wood, Here's what they might conclude. The wood was darker than it should have been. True, the centuries-old trees that formed it grew tall and dense, but the permanent gloom that appeared to rest upon ash wood contravened the laws of light and shadow. The twigs and branches of its trees creaked and rattled like dry bones. Leaves were parched brown. Flowers, on the rare occasions that they bloomed, grew dried and shriveled on their desiccated stalks. It defied logic how, even when the surrounding area became waterlogged after heavy rains, the soil in the wood remained dry and cracked. The more imaginative visitor might surmise that it was as if the very earth of the wood smouldered with an insatiable ire that sucked the nurturing moisture out of anything that tried to flourish within it. I am going to jump to a section where uh, Jane has been uh, left on her own to look after Millie the cat. Her friend has left with her husband on holiday uh, and Jane is trying to get the cat indoors but the cat is fascinated by the wood at the bottom of the garden which Jane is trying to avoid having already had an unnerving experience there. Millie! Here, Kitty, biscuit time. But there was no response. Jane climbed the steps from the patio to the lawn, but there was no sign of Millie. She rattled the dry cat food once more. Millie, 
Here, kitty, kitty. Silence. Then a troubled meow from somewhere up ahead. Millie? Jane hesitated for a moment longer, then headed off across the lawn, alternately shaking the cat biscuit box and calling out. But there was no further response. Jane slowed as she neared the end of the garden. She called out again, and this time was rewarded with a small plaintive mew just ahead of her, in the unmown grass by the fallen wire fence demarcating the boundary between the garden and Ashwood beyond. Then Cat Biscuits were spilling on the lawn as the box slipped from her grasp. Her ears rang with the stupefying, ominous, primal chant, like the rhythmic pounding of a giant black heart, or the pulsing of a dark star on the far side of the cosmos. She was paralysed with fear, unable to scream as a will stronger than her own forced its way into her mind. Her thoughts were fragmenting, dissipating. Her very essence was being forced from her body into the chill evening air. Then something bumped against her leg, and an urgent feline yowl burst through the veil that was descending upon Jane, breaking the spell, bringing her back. She was Jane once more, and she was screaming. She scooped Millie up in her arms and ran back to the cottage. Those were extracts from The Cat Sitter, which was published in a micro-collection called Shadow Cats by Blackshuck Books. Thanks very much for listening.